Welcome to the in-person worship service for Clarendon United Methodist Church. We're so happy you joined us today. The order of worship can be found on our website, www.clarendonumc.org slash worship. There you will also be able to give your tithes and offerings online, www.clarendonumc.org slash give. We thank you so much for your support during this time of need. Now, let us join our hearts in worship. rise as you are able for the greeting. Gather us in, the brokenhearted and the joyful. Gather us in, the weak and the strong. Gather us in, the fearful and the brave. Gather us in, the young and the old. Gather us in, to sing of God's works. Gather us in, Gather us in to worship and wonder. Gather us in to know God's love. <laughs>
Let us pray. Merciful God, we gather together to offer you our praise and thanksgiving for the unfailing love you have shown towards us generation after generation and for the compassion you shower upon us day after day. You alone are our God. We are your people. We pray that your Holy Spirit would move among us as we worship. Open our hearts and our minds to see you work among us. Encouraging, challenging, uplifting, and inspiring, as each one has been made. May our worship bring honor and glory to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please be seated, friends. We rejoice in this opportunity to gather in the name of Jesus Christ today. Welcome to all of you. It is a special treat to have the choir with us, uh, the choir that has not been able to gather in the choir loft and sing for, what does it feel like, 100 years now? 48 months. Yeah. So long. This is the, the first opportunity to do that. They are about to take a summer break, so we're having a, a taste treat right now on this Sunday, and then we'll look forward to them uh, returning to our regular worship in the days to come. So thank you, choir. We love you very much. We also have our praise band music uh, this morning. I know Mike has a, a beautiful song to share today. Uh, a special welcome this morning to our new friends, friends that we are, are about to meet today uh, from Arlington Forest United Methodist Church, some of whom I believe were also at Arlington United Methodist Church in previous years. So we are, are gathering in our neighbors uh, on an important day for us all to establish new relationships and be family to one another. And so we issue you a warm welcome. There will be a newcomers gathering for new friends from Arlington Forest and any other newcomers to the church who would like to come and it's sort of like a meet the pastor plus because there are other leaders and so forth who um, are coming to just have a conversation, just talk with each other and answer questions you may have, etc. cetera. We're, gonna, we're going to be doing that in what we call the praise room. The praise room, let me just give you directions to it now as we are early in the service uh, so that you can know if you're coming to it. If you leave by this exit, and go down to the elevator, just around the corner to the elevator, and down one floor. When you get off the elevator, turn left. So go to the elevator, down a floor, turn left. It'll take you to the praise room, which will also be on your left. We'll be down there uh, with smiles on our faces. I will be leaving directly after the service, rather than shaking hands at the door, just to be able to uh, make that connection with those of you who are new to the church family. So we welcome you all. It really is uh, a joy for us. At an important time in your journey, um, we're glad that there can be the joy of new relationships that uh, can be a part of uh, our shared journey of faith together. Uh, we also have, if you may have noticed, uh, elements of our new audiovisual system. Actually, it's all in place now. Um, we will be live streaming later in the season once we've got all of the training underway and so forth to be able to make that happen. Uh, but for now, we have uh, a system in place and no more scaffolding in the room to make it happen. So that is a wonderful thing. And so we're going to dedicate that uh, audiovisual system uh, later in the service, and it's a, a very important um, part of our life together post-COVID. We're not quite post, uh, but we're moving into 
post-COVID period right now. Um, it's an AV system that will help us to have an enhanced worship experience, but will especially also help those who are uh, watching the service online. And so we are grateful that you get to be seeing through much better cameras instead of iPhones stuck on little tripods around the place. Uh, we actually have good cameras that are, are doing uh, serious work and it also helps us to reach out to the larger community. In the 21st century, that is really important to be able to use technology to do that. And so now we are able to do that and learning the process to be able to set that in place. So this is an important day for a number of reasons for this congregation and we celebrate it. So later in the service we'll have a time to dedicate this new equipment to the glory of God and to the service of the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ here in this room and abroad and really abroad, like around the world. What a remarkable thing that we can do that. So welcome on this day. May God's grace be with us, upon us, and within us as we come together in the name of Jesus Christ. Are there any children, if they'd like to come forward? Hello. So does anybody here have a brother or a sister? Okay, you do? Do you have a brother or sister? You have, all right, you have two. Well, even though I'm really old, I have an older sister, if you can believe that. But when I was little, I used to touch her toys without her permission. <laughs> do you ever do that with your brother or sister's toys? Oh, you oh, okay, you, you admitted it, but that's okay. Well, you know, oh, yes. Oh, you do it? You do that sometimes? Okay, well, good. I'm glad to know I'm not the only one. Well, when I would do that, sometimes I would hear a loud voice, and that was my sister, and she would say, <clears throat> who touched my toys? <laughs> do you think I was afraid when I heard that? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I was afraid because she was bigger than I was. But I did it anyway. Well, today's story in the Bible is about touching, and it's also about being afraid. But we need a visual aid. So that's what I have here. We're going to spread this out a little bit. You can hold that. See how far it goes. OK. Who's pulling this? Oh, you are. Oh, I can, you can touch that. Go ahead. All right. So the story of the Bible today, like I said, is about touching and being afraid. And one day, Jesus was walking around with a big crowd around him, a huge crowd. And in that crowd, there was one woman who was very, very sick. And she thought, you know, Jesus is so powerful. I'll bet that if I just walk up and touch the back of his cloak, I won't be sick anymore. So she snuck up behind Jesus and she touched his robe. And immediately she said, oh, I feel good now, I'm cured. But the next thing happened was kind of scary. Jesus turned around and he said, who touched my clothes? Do you think the woman was afraid? Yeah, she was afraid. Jesus was a big guy and uh, he was important. So she was afraid. But then Jesus' friend said, Jesus, come on. You got, she's here, she could have touched your clothes. It's a huge crowd. That person could have touched your clothes. Anybody could have touched your clothes. What do you mean who touched me? But Jesus was really smart. And he looked in the crowd and he knew someone special had touched him. What happened next? The woman came forward and she knelt before Jesus and she said, Jesus, I knew that if I just touched your clothes, I'd be healed, and it worked. And Jesus looked at her, and he loved her. He said, my daughter, he called her his daughter because he loved her so much. Your faith has healed you. And then a little later in the story, as we'll hear in the scriptures, 
He looks at the whole crowd and he says, don't be afraid. Just believe. So that's what's important in the story. And there are a couple themes in the story that I want you to remember. The first one is, you can't sneak up on Jesus. And that's good news because Jesus doesn't want you to sneak up on him. He's there waiting for you. He's waiting to help you. And the second thing is, don't be afraid. Jesus is waiting to meet you. And if you need help, he's going to provide it. Don't be afraid. So let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your healing touch. Help us to share it with others and help us to never be afraid. This morning's scripture is from the Gospel of Mark. You will find it in the New Testament section of the Pew Bible on page 39. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And the disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see if he could tell who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I have an important question to ask of you today, a question that I have never asked you before. What is your favorite kind of Oreo cookie? You come to Clarendon UMC and you get asked important questions. Is that not the truth? What is your favorite 
Oreo cookie. Perhaps you're a classic Oreo type. Chocolate, mm, very good. Maybe you love those uh, blonde cookies, the vanilla ones, or it, people in my family were excited when lemon came out. By now, there are flavors like peppermint and one I just heard of, Java chip Oreos. My goodness. Now, personally, I'm sorry, I'm a purist. It's classic chocolate all the way when it comes to Oreos. Yeah, I see, I see, Cher, you agree with me. Well, I'd be interested in some, at some point in knowing your answer to the question of what your favorite is. I'd also be interested in knowing the answer to that question if I could ask it of Mark, the writer of our gospel today. Because Mark is clearly an Oreo guy. No snickerdoodles, no ginger snaps for Mark. Absolutely not. Our scripture passage today shows us that Mark prefers Oreos. This text is often called a Markin sandwich. Two stories interlocked with each other. One is the Oreo cookie on the outside, and the other is the cream right in the middle. It's interesting, Mark does this quite a bit in his gospel, quite a number of times, and don't ask me why, but usually when it's stories relating to women. I guess women are the ones who get to eat Oreos. Sorry, guys. You'll have to leave them for us. But Mark clearly likes that style of telling a story. He wants to tie these two stories together in our mind. The story of the unnamed woman who comes to him and in need of healing, wrapped in a larger story of a father caring about the healing. To, to see these stories interact with each other. The, the cookie part, the chocolate wafer part of the story is the tale of Jairus and his daughter. We sometimes get the sense that Jesus wasn't liked by any of the Jewish leaders, but this story shows us, it's a good example to show us that that isn't quite true. Jairus was a Jewish leader in his community, someone who would have every reason to come before Jesus for the whole crowd to make way for him to be able to come and speak to this famous healer, Jesus, now so popular in the community. Here comes Jairus, make way so he can talk to the healer. But instead, Jairus comes and gets down before Jesus, bows before Jesus in desperation. He, he pleads for Jesus to come and heal his daughter at his home. Well, Jesus agrees to, to go in that direction, but his path, Jesus' path to Jairus' house, is blocked for a time by a throng, a crowd of people. And from within that pressing crowd, there is one woman, we're never given her name, one woman who approaches Jesus secretly. We have learned that great reality, you can't sneak up on Jesus. I always learn from the children's sermon, don't you? I always learn from it. You can't sneak up on Jesus. So, so this unnamed woman, in, in contrast to Jairus, the great named person, this woman is never given a name due to all the socio-religious dynamics of the day. She needs healing. And so she also seeks out this healer, Jesus, whose reputation is growing. This is the Oreo cream part of the story, sandwiched in the middle but trying to tell us more about Jesus, the healer. Mark wants his readers to interpret these two distinctive healing stories in light of each other. The tale of the unnamed woman is a remarkable one for us to hear with our 21st century sensibilities. Both Jesus and the woman could tell that something had happened the moment she touched his garment. She could tell that suddenly 
this hemorrhaging she had been plagued with for years had immediately stopped. And he could tell that, as, as Mark says, Jesus knew that power had gone forth from him, that a healing had taken place. What a remarkable thing for her to experience in that flash of a second. The, the healing that she had sought from doctor after doctor after doctor. She may be unnamed, but she is clearly part of the elite class in her community to be able to afford doctor after doctor after doctor, and yet she is still not given a name. That healing moment must have been profound and dramatic, almost overwhelming for the woman, but, but being overwhelmed was not over because when Jesus realized that the power had gone forth from him, he immediately turned. And the, the Greek word that is used makes it clear that he gave an intense glare. He didn't just look at the crowd. He gave an intense glare. Another place I can imagine that intense glare was happening was when Jesus was on trial and the cock crowed the third time. And one of the gospels says he looked. He looked at Peter. Well, this glare from Jesus, I don't think I'd like to be on the other side of that glare. Do you? That seems a little uncomfortable. Seems overwhelming. And here is this woman who has just experienced the healing she has sought for so long. She's amazed, and then the glare comes. And the gospel makes it clear that she has fear. She's afraid. And, and yet she has been desperate enough to take this bold move. And so she doesn't just scurry away. That boldness remains in her. That searching for true healing gets translated into true speech. And she lets Jesus know that she is the one who touched his garment. His, his look and her truth meet one another. And he says to her something surprising at that point in the story. Daughter, your faith has made you well. You have believed. And in believing, you have found new life, a new future, new hope and promise given to you in your need. Jesus heals. And in this story, the healing is profound and so deeply needed. Well, now the narrative returns to the chocolate cookie part. Mm, well, isn't that interesting to have a, an alarm go off? I have no idea what I'm supposed to remember at 1030 in the middle of a sermon, but an alarm has gone off. I am to remember to tell you about Jairus, the chocolate cookie part of the sermon, of the story. Jairus, this one who loved his daughter so dearly. Notice he didn't just say, my daughter. He called her, my little daughter. Just hear the love in that. It's not, uh, my daughter. It's my little daughter. Now, she's 12 years old, which isn't so little. She's not a tiny daughter. But you know, his love for her is such that she's going to be little, his little daughter forever. It's not even a term of her height or her age. It's, she's my little daughter. His love for her is profound. And so he brings himself to Jesus and, and begs for healing. They arrive to the house after this delay, the Oreo cream part of the story. Now they arrive at Jairus' house and they receive confirmation from inside of that dreaded reality. Your daughter has died. You can imagine what he's feeling when he hears those words about his little daughter. The pain, 
the grief, overwhelmed. That's how he must have felt, overwhelmed with a rush of grief and fear and loss. My future is over. But Jesus challenges Jairus to hold on to his faith. Only believe, he says. A faith that led him to look for this healer in the first place. And Jesus goes further. He goes in, as the story has been told to us, in a children's sermon and in a scripture reading, he goes and reaches out to this child and says words of hope and promise. Talitha Kumi, little girl, get up. And she rises. I was reading one commentary this week that, that talked about that moment in the little girl's life. Her future was over, but now a healing has happened. Something has happened. It never really explains what has happened in this story. Something has happened, but her future is, is still there. She still has a future, and yet she's changed. We can imagine what that moment must have been like. This, this commentator said, she must have gotten up and, and gone and touched things in the room, touched things around her, and, and looked carefully at faces. Her father, this healer, Jesus, others in the room from her community that she had known all her life. She must have touched her own face and looked at her clothing. I have a future and promise for me. She doesn't know the whole story, doesn't know of her father's trek, probably doesn't know of the, the chocolate cookie and the Oreo sent her. She only knows that her future is restored, is still there. Jesus' life gave life to others. His healing power was profound and life-changing, life-giving. It's not just his death and resurrection that changed lives. His life changed lives. All wrapped up together, life and death and resurrection in this one Savior. And in his life, he touched and healed many, including this little girl. Not so little, but loved. Jesus' life gives life. It's, it's a healing authority. It crosses boundaries. Just in chapter 5 of Mark's gospel, it's crossing all kinds of boundaries, ethnic, gender boundaries, boundaries, big walls between people, and yet Jesus' healing crosses those boundaries. Jesus always chooses not to leave people in the same condition he finds them in. He has the power to change lives. Do you find that in your own life, that Jesus meets you right where you are and yet isn't content to leave you there? Jesus always wants to bring you to that better place, that next better place for you to open up your future in new ways. And he does that for both of these persons. For the unnamed woman whose future opens up after years of suffering. And for a child whose certain ending has turned into a new beginning. Jesus' life gave life. Just touching his clothes, not even his body, brought life to others. We are the body of Christ, alive and at work in the world today. As the body of Christ, do we bring life in the world? Do we cross 
boundaries, walls in our culture that separate ethnicities, beliefs, things that separate us so profoundly in our culture. Are we not to cross boundaries, any boundaries that divide us in our society related to to ethnicity, gender, race, sexual orientation, politics, anything. Aren't we to cross boundaries and give life, be the life of Christ at work in today's world and advocate for life giving meaningful change? We've come to know that this kind of work in our world is not easy, this kind of work in our families, in our communities, in our nation, in our world. It's hard to, in the overwhelming nature of this world, to be the bearers of the life of Christ. Sometimes it it causes us to be afraid, (laughs) fearful, because it sets us apart from those around us. calls us into contrast as we challenge norms that erect boundaries instead of bring them down. Sometimes we're just afraid because change is hard. Even if it means a change in our own lives, getting news from a doctor that suddenly means your diet has to change or your lifestyle has to change or you've got to, to make new pathways, it it brings up fear, even in our own lives, much less as we relate to the world. Jesus, in the story of Jairus' daughter, has a a little detail Mark tells that I, I like. Jesus asked them to bring her some food. Don't you think food is a great way to mark a new beginning? By the way, we're gonna have a little bit of food available downstairs when we go to the praise room. Those of you who are newcomers coming to this family of faith, marking new beginnings, futures stretching out before us together. We're going to mark it with food because Jesus knew that that's a good idea, that, that eating together, being together, body and soul, and spirit together means there's future before us because we follow one who is alive and at work in this world, granting healing and grace. We need not be afraid and overwhelmed We come out of a pandemic that has been such a fearful time, and yet the future is still before us. Our life in Christ continues. Yeah, I love those classic Oreos. Nothing like them. And I'm glad Mark does too. I'm glad Mark offers us the grace to hear that in our most overwhelming times, the healing power of Jesus brings us life. Just a touch even of his garment can make us whole. Coming to Jesus means we have a future. Oh, thanks be to God. Can you say it with me? Thanks be to God. Amen. We are a people with a future. We are a people at work in the world today as the body of Christ. And we have a future. And we are marking a a step on the journey into this new future as we move out of a time of pandemic we're we're taking the step of dedicating this equipment in our sanctuary, equipment to be used for the building up of the body of Christ. So I welcome Laura Watson, who is the chair of our trustees. And if uh, you can turn in your order of worship to the words of dedication, we will join in this time together. First, 
let's give Laura a chance to say words of introduction. We, we present this audiovisual system to be consecrated to the glory of the Almighty God and for the service of this con congregation. Let's join together in the words we find printed. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To sing praises to your name, O Most High. To declare your steadfast love in the morning. And your faithfulness at night. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. And the works of your hands I sing for joy. Let us pray. Creating and recreating God. We give thanks for the gifts of all who have gone before us. We give thanks for all who are here now. And we give thanks for the promise of gifts that have yet to be shared. We pause to remember with gratitude all those who come before us, came before us and generously offered their financial gifts. We give thanks for those who continue to give in faith in order to further the work to which you have called this church. May this new audiovisual system help enrich the life of this faith community and offer all who are a part of it a fuller worship experience. May the gift of this resource allow us to provide those who worship beyond our walls a deeper encounter with you. And may this equipment allow us to share your message of salvation and love with those who do not yet know you. May we be encouraged to raise voices in praise in response to hearing God's promise, God's hope, and God's love. Amen.
now in peace. Family of faith, you are beloved of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, may God's blessing be upon you, now and evermore. Amen. Welcome to the newcomers event this way. If you can help. 